the prompt here. Welcome everyone to FISMA Fridays. Delighted that we are continuing to host these monthly sessions. I believe it's um, three years running now, of our monthly discussions with the Atchison Group team. Delighted for today's topic, we'll be discussing the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. And for our regulars with FISMA Fridays, as you know, we always send out a recording link after these sessions. In the next day or so, you will get that. Um, let me go ahead and make sure the slides are going. We will take some questions. In fact, we have a question from our FISMA Fridays LinkedIn group um, that we'll be talking about today, as well as have some discussion topics. Um, for privacy reasons, wow, quite a few people coming online with us today, but you'll only see the panelists. And um, of course, if you have trouble hearing, please um, go ahead and dial it into the call-in number. Delighted to have Christopher Stamps with the tag team online with us today. I believe this might be your, your second FISMA Fridays, right, Christopher? Yes, thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone, for joining yeah. us. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Thank you. I'll, I'll share a quick story with uh, the folks out there. Christopher and I have been talking um, through the month, but we had the chance to actually meet live at GFSI event, and we we're chatting about FISMA Fridays and delighted to uh, get you back on for today's topic, which I know certainly is near and dear to your heart that you have um, know quite a bit, so I'm, I'm delighted that you'll be sharing with us today. But before we get started, Christopher, why don't you share with us what's the latest on the FISMA front? Well, uh, lately, uh, what's new with the FDA is uh, we have a new FDA commissioner, Scott Gallup, and he is working on assigning inspectors to their area of expertise and their specialties, not necessarily their geographical location. It's a new realignment of the inspectors, and they're no longer going to follow the existing five district boundaries that the FDA has set. Other things that are new uh, is in relation to the FSVP program. Uh, in March of this year, the FDA released uh, guidance that said you can now use your DUNS number as a way to uh, be recognized as a unique facility identifier, or the UFI. The uh, DUNS number is free. You can get it from Dun and Bradstreet. It's an easy thing to do right on online. You can do it online. And you can receive it within as a few, in a few days up to 45 days. The most recent thing that's new is that last week the FDA sent out another guidance that institutes uh, how the FDA importer can enter their recognized UFI number as well as what category they are. So there's three different, or I'm sorry, there are four different categories that the importer can put in. He can put in the letters F, S, V, meaning they are, they are subject to the program. They can put in F, S, X, meaning they are exempt. They can put R, N, E in, meaning that the food that's being imported is for research or evaluation. And if they do not yet have a DUNS number, yet they still need to put something in, in order to get the food into customs, you can put in the letters U and K, which means unknown. And that's a temporary designation, and the FDA will be contacting those individuals shortly thereafter to assist them to make sure that they do get a DUNS number. And that is the latest that I have with the FDA. You know, that, that's interesting about the temporary. Um, you know, temporary in government can last, what, years, months? We have any indication what that temporary means? Um, <laughs> That's the interesting, you know, one, right? Sooner than later. How's that? Yes. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We have um, a compliance date fast approaching here. I believe the end of this month, um, May 30th, for compliance for the first round of the FSCP program. And, um, you know, we'll just go ahead and dive in on some of the key questions and helping demystify it. So, Christopher, if you could share with us, how does the um, FSVP rule apply to? Who, who does it reply, um, apply to? Excuse me. Sure. It's a great question, and it's a commonly asked question. And we need to take a quick step back and talk about size of a company versus dollars. Um, I bring this up because the preventive controls rules that a lot of people are familiar with are, are based on full-time employee size as to when it goes into effect. The FSPP program, on the other hand, is based on the amount of dollars that are imported. So for human food, if you average a million dollars per year during a three-year pe period preceding 
the calendar year when you began. Any sales of human food combined with the U.S. market of human food imported, manufactured, processed, packed, or held without sale. So that's what the $1 million mark is. For animal food, it's $2.5 million. So if you need or exceed those dollar values, then it applies to you. Um, other questions that are commonly asked in regards to who it applies to is just some basic questions that you have to ask yourself. If you're an importer with a foreign supplier, are you covered by the FISMA preventive control rules or produce safety rules? Are you subject to the PC rules for human food and not a small business, qualified facility, or subject to the pasteurized milk ordinance? Or if you're subject to CGMPs of FISMA preventive controls for animal food and not a small business or qualified. Otherwise, you are required to be in compliance by May 30th. If none of those apply to you, would you still be subject to the rule? And the answer is that you could be. Now, the FDA provides a chart, and it's called Am I Subject to FSVP? And it lists a lot of exemptions as well as unique qualifying characteristics. And I highly recommend that people go to the FDA website and take a look at that chart and see if those individual exemptions apply to you or don't apply to you. And that chart will help you to determine whether or not it applies to you. Um, if you are subject to preventive control rules, in general, you're exempt from FSVP. But you remember, you still need the importer identification and entry. Okay, interesting. I think with that with that chart, it sounds like that would be really useful. We'll, we'll dig that out and post that on the FISMA Fridays LinkedIn group, and I'm sure it's probably up or will be posted on the TAG group um, site as well, so we'll mention that. Um, great. Uh, shall, we, shall we move on to the ne next uh, question? Yes. Wonderful. So with all this, I know there's a lot of talk out there, and there's certainly um, some key misnomers or misconceptions that I know your your team is seeing. Could you share some of those with us um, surrounding this rule? Sure. There are, there are many brokers who are, who are the importer of record who do not understand the rule in general. Uh, they need to understand that they have to either be a qualified individual, a QI, or use a QI to perform the various FSVP tasks that are required for each food ingredient, not just each supplier. Um, the importer can take an FSVP course as developed by the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance and recognized by the FDA and to assist in becoming a qualified individual. It's highly recommended and TAG offers the course for training but is not required. Other items in particular is the hazard analysis. Hazard analysis needs to be completed, and in many cases, the broker or the importer has little to no microbiological or science-based background in food safety. Um, many times, they have little understanding of what a preventive control is, how it's validated, verified, and why it's important in improving a, a foreign supplier, which is a key step of the FSP, FSVP rule. Other items that we are running into is people, or I'm sorry, importers have to realize is that it takes time to complete each FSVP. Yet many not, have not even started. Um, the FDA is taking the stance of educate before regulate, so there will be some leeway in the beginning, but for how long, nobody really knows. Um, if the importer or broker has not started, the FSVP process, they need to do so today. Um, other issues we're seeing is that the importer must be physically located in the U.S. So that is an eye-opener for some companies. Um, other items is that the supplier risk associated needs to be reassessed every three years unless otherwise warranted. And there is an exemption that some people know about and some don't. And that's in regards to packaging and food contact surfaces. Right now, there is a two-year exemption to May of 2019. Wow, those, um, it's interesting when you talk about those. I know um, within your team, you are everywhere, and then you, you get 
these questions all the time. So, so thank you um, for sharing that. So if you could share then also as far as um, how, how does this rule complement DISMA? Sure. So DISMA in general is designed to keep the U.S. food supply safe. And according to the FDA, about 15% of all food is imported into the U.S. And that's usually broken down to about 50% fresh fruit, 20% of our fresh vegetables, and 80% of our seafood is imported in the U.S. It comes from over 200 countries, and it's estimated at about 125,000 farms. Therefore, FSVP is designed to address the food we bring into the U.S. to make sure that the public is protected. It's important that FSMA is uh, realized that it's designed to be a preventive or proactive mechanism for our food supply. In the past, our food supply and the FDA was reactive to them then. So now we're trying to prevent them to begin with. When FSVP is implemented, it fills in that last gap of all the FDA regulated food that's come into the U.S. And so all of our domestic and now our imported food as of May 30th is going to be covered. Okay, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Well, moving on to the uh, the next question, what are some of the key challenges um, that folks out there joining us today might might have in, in applying with this rule? Well, Jill, there are several challenges. Although uh, the information about FSVP and its implementation, they've been out for over a year, many companies are still unaware that they even need to follow the rule. Um, there are companies that think the FSVP can be picked up off the shelf, so to speak, and completed quickly. But in reality, it takes time, sometimes a month or more, to complete the FSVP. And it depends on the number of ingredients or food items that's being imported. Even if the food is imported and does not need an FSVP due to being exempt, for example, each food still needs documentation that was assessed by a qualified individual to give it that designation, such as RNE or FSX that we talked about earlier. Another key challenge is documentation and organizing the documentation. For each FSVP, uh, the documentation can be either in paper form or electronic format or any combination thereof. But uh, in all documentation, must be assessed in the language that a QI is proficient in. So for example, if all the documentation is in French, then the QI must be able to read and understand French to, in order to assess it and determine, determine if it's sufficient. One of the provisions that the FSVP must realize is that any documentation that's requested by the FDA for inspection or review must be translated into English. The FDA is giving the quote unquote reasonable amount of time to do that translation, but it still must be done. Um, the other item is that there's a minimum of nine types of records that are required. And if people want to know what those nine divisions are, we can talk about that at the end. Okay, great. No, thank you. I think that, that leads us to um, that question about what should companies that the rule does not apply to be aware of, right? There's certainly got to be some impacts, um, something, you know, there are areas that can impact them with this rule, correct? Correct. So companies need to be aware that if their importer is providing food or ingredients that do not require an FSVP because the, the manufacturer will be controlling the hazard here in the U.S., that it still must be di disclosed in the documents that come with the food. Letters of assurance will, will be required in May of 2019 between the manufacturer and the importer, and that's going to be done annually. And that will disclose that the hazard will be controlled by either the manufacturer or the manufacturer's supply chain. Uh, another impact uh, is there is a potential of misuse of the DUNS number by an importer without the manufacturer's knowledge. It's very important that there is a good working relationship and open communication between the manufacturer and its importer or broker. Another thing that is important is that you must determine who will be designated as the FSVP importer well in advance of shipping food so the FSVP requirements can be met 
and no difficulties will occur when the food is being imported. That's interesting. When you were talking about the misuse, I know that this topic has come up um, in previous uh, Business Fridays in the respect that, you know, the, the assumption is perhaps the misuse is not knowing what they should be doing. Um, so I don't know how much latitude with that unknown designation you were talking about earlier, um, how long that will last, right? I think it's a lot to do with education, I would presume, hopefully. Um, yes, yes, a lot of education. And then if you do put in the, the unknown designation, uh, be sure that uh, or be aware that the FDA will be knocking on your door to help you determine what your designation is supposed to be. Oh, that's interesting. So well, is there some alert system or something uh, that those are, are red flagged, those, those uh, designations? Well, the FDA will be creating a database of all FSCP registrants. And that database is going to be open to the public once it's put together. So that's one way to determine who is an FSCP importer. Mm, okay. So, so they'll be proactively viewing it, sounds like. Yes. Um, I, I could see that topic or a good line of discussion in future FISMA Fridays in, you know, six months or later in the year, and people can share their stories if, if things have come up like that. So, good. Thank yeah. you. Let's see. I think at this point we got through the designated questions pretty quickly, and that's good because um, typically we have some questions that come in, and I do see that some that have come in as well. So as those queue up, um, I did want to share a couple quick things as well. Um, certainly, as we all know, the Atchison Group um, is a great resource um, for all things FISMA. And um, I really encourage, if people don't, um, subscribe to your blog post, um, your blog on the Atchison Group site. Um, please do. Us here at Safety Chain do. Um, it's a great resource for keeping up with um, all the different components of FISMA and so forth. And then also, um, of course, I'm going to mention, and as we see a good few questions coming up, that FISMA um, requirements and be able to uh, manage FISMA, um, all the different components within your daily programs, Safety Chain um, helps with that. And delighted special call out to a bunch of customers that are online with us today. So thank you for joining us. And again, for those um, looking to bring technology and get rid of paper in order to get better data and control of your programs, certainly give us a holler. The other thing I want to mention, and we'll go through that with a few questions here that came in, is we are really delighted to have, have launched um, FISMA Friday's LinkedIn group. It looks like we have a um, slow build up of that, and a question did come in relative to today's session. So I'm going to go ahead and just dive into it. It's a bit long, um, but it's a good one. So I put it up here as a slide, and I'll, I'll read it. I'll slow down. I talk too fast sometimes. Um, and Christopher, we can go ahead and address it. But the question that came in, is there any way we would know that a company has been named as a SVP, FSVP importer by another importer broker for a specific delivery in this system when we are not expecting it? Well, there, there will be a way. Uh, as I mentioned in the prior, prior topic or the prior slide, the FDA is going to create that database, and that's going to be uh, from all registrants with the customs department. And once it's on there, they will be able to do some research to see if somebody has named them. But depending on the circumstance, uh, if you did not cause that food to be imported into the U.S., then you would have not, you would not have an FSCP responsibility for that food. So the FDA would not be able to get you for that. Should this happen, you do need to point out to the FDA that you are not the importer of this food shipment per FDA definitions of an importer in an FSVP system. So you can say, show your documentation, say that it's not me, and that should be acceptable. It might take a, a few phone calls back and forth, but it can be done. Okay, great. Now that is interesting, you know, that sort of grouping, if you will. Um, let me go ahead and, and take a through a couple more questions, if you don't mind, Chris. Do you have a little time here? 
we'll yes, see. Sure, Hopefully, we'll see. Okay, great. And again, with the caveat that, um, Christopher, I know how much well vested you are in this topic, but let's see if there's things here that might help you a little bit. Here we go. Um, what if we are a distributor handling only unexposed products, only subject to the modified requirements in the PC rule? And I'm, sorry, I'm just trying to look at um, the rest of that question there. Um, only subject to the um, temperature controls. Are we still subject so, to the PC rule, but are we subject to F FSVP as well? So if the hazard has already been taken care of by the supplier through the FSVP's review, then they're all set. If the hazard has not been taken care of by the supplier that, that the importer is addressing, the manufacturer will still need to follow the preventive control rules for that hazard. And I'm not sure if I answered that question correctly. I might need some clarification on their part exactly what they're asking. Okay, great. We'll, we'll see if that clarification comes in. A couple other questions I'll throw at you in the meantime. FDA has recognized um, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada as having comparable food safety systems. Does that change anything with, uh, within the uh, FSVP for those specific countries? Yeah, so if you're importing food from a recognized, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a recognized country, there is a process to put in that is being recognized from, I'm sorry, it is being imported from that, and you have much less responsibilities as, as an FSVP importer. You still have to do the assessment to see whether or not it qualifies and document what you do. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. And, and I'll go ahead and do a, a follow-up question, and I, I could see quite a few Canadian companies online with us today, which is not surprising. Um, so this question is, um, so the FSVP importer must be located in the U.S. If a Canadian company has a registered business in the U.S. with a mailing address, the U.S. business entity cannot be the FSP importer? And if that's a, a, an interesting question, a little bit of a puzzle there, but sorry. So, uh, according to how we interpret the, the FDA's writing of the FSVP rule, the importer must physically be located within the U.S. Okay. So that, that seem, seemingly seems um, fairly straightforward, hopefully, um, but yes. I know not always the case. <laughs> uh, here's another question I'll throw at you, and I appreciate your patience as we read through these. Um, we are a Canadian fresh produce exporter who import produce from Mexico to Canada but repack and export to the USA, are we required to use the DUNS number for shipments going to all our U.S. customers or as the exporter only use our FDA registration number? Will the, will the food be consumed by anybody within the U.S.? So that's my follow-up question. If it is not being consumed within the U.S., they can use the DUNS, DUNS number to get it in, but I do not believe uh, all the rules apply to them. I would have to do an additional follow-up on that to give you some further details. Okay, great. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because it's um, sort of a crisscross puzzle on that one, and perhaps we can uh, post that on our FISMA Friday's um, LinkedIn group, the, uh, the follow-up to that, so thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, do have, it looks like just a few more here. Um, this looks good as far as this one goes. If you're an importer importing from a supplier with less than 500 employees, are they subject to this um, compliance date um, on May 30th? Again, if you're an importer, it does not go by employee size. It goes by the dollar amount that the importer is importing. And that's interesting because that's very different from the other um, the other rules, correct? Um, yes. On that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a clear it's distinction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because there's uh, there's always been that cross of the line with if you're this size employee. So I think we've all been conditioned to think in that manner, right? 
Um, right. and there, is that? there are some additional there are some additional exemptions, and um, that's also in the rule. And if, if you would like, I could send it to you at a later date. But there are some additional smaller exemptions. It's a smaller expense. I feel like we need like a flow chart for all these exemptions and everything. Yeah, just the kind flow of chart. Keep up with it all. Yeah, the flow chart would would detail that. Yes, it's, it's a great resource. Oh, great. Um, okay, I see um, just about one more question. I think that we have time for today, and let me um, um, go ahead and, and pose this to you, Christopher. As a distributor that buys and resells imported products but we did not place the original, excuse me, original order for, and we're listed as the original co-signee, what is our role in FSBP? So you can only, that. yeah, you can reread that. Yeah, just because it's a little of a tongue twister there. As a distributor that buys and resells imported products, but we did not place the original order for, and we're listed as the original cons consignee, what is our role in the FSBP compliance? So if, if they were not the original consignee, then a different entity has to be the original consignee. So, so the way the FSBP system works, only one entity can enter in that DUNS number. Um, I'm not sure if I answered that question, what they're looking for. Um, it almost sounds like if, if they're wondering if their number is being misused. Um, right. Yeah, so again, I would have to uh, get some additional information from that individual. If they could send another further question to clarify that, it would be great. Right. You know, it's interesting because it, you know, indicates we're listed as the original co-signee, but that would not be the case if with the scenario presented, um, at least, um, you know, from a black and white scenario. Okay, thank you. Um, and I lied, there's one more question I'm just going to uh, uh, throw at you if you don't mind, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up today's rapid fire session. Some great questions coming in. Um, if you're importing packaged foods from a sister manufacturing facility in Canada only for redistribution to the U.S., do we qualify for modified requirements? And again, yes. um, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy yes, yes. And it, what, can I make that assumption when you say a sister manufacturing facility that the original or um, um, manufacturing facilities in the U.S.? Is, is that what that's referenced to? Uh, yes, and it's the fact that Canada is a recognized food system. Okay, got it. Thank you for that clarification. Wow, um, quite a few questions. We, we always get a lot of questions, but I think this one has definitely um, been a hot topic, and I'm not surprised um, given the um, amount of news out there, and we do try to keep up with it, but, um, you know, on the peripheral, so, so thank you, Christopher. It's, it's um, a lot out there, and I appreciate your willingness to uh, go to bat and try to answer these questions in this fashion. I um, mean, again, um, with, oh, sorry, what were you going to say? It's my pleasure, Joe. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I think, um, again, we'll look to add some of these answers to the FISMA Friday's LinkedIn group. Um, if you haven't joined yet, um, we'll go ahead and put a link to that in the follow-up email that goes out with the recording. So I encourage you to join because we do post only FISMA Friday's related items in that LinkedIn group. And we encourage people to ask questions that we can bring on to the next topic. And with that, I should make mention of that. Um, our next um, session will be the end of June. This one was a bit earlier this month, given the U.S. holiday coming up of Memorial Day. But again, our next um, session will be June 30th. We certainly hope um, that we will see you out there. I, I know both the Atchison Group and Safety Chain is um, regularly um, attends different events, where we were, whether sponsoring or just attending, as we did with GFSI. Um, but again, there's a few food conferences coming up, um, North American Food Safety and Quality Summit in Chicago, a food safety um, supply chain conference in Rockville, Maryland. And then I'm also very excited. Um, we'll be hosting a webinar um, in June, later in June, about the best practices for avoiding allergen recalls. Uh, we know that that's you know, the number one recall. So again, I would definitely encourage folks to sign up for the blog post, if I can plug that again for the Atchison Group, because um, we certainly appreciate getting all that information. 
And I really appreciate the participation here today. It's uh, quite the crowd on with us. And Christopher, honestly, thank you so much um, for the rapid fire answers here. And we'll look forward to having you um, join us again soon. Great. Thank you, Joe. And thank everybody for listening. Okay. Thank you all. I have a good Friday.